World Series is here, and we are breaking down what this mega matchup means for MLB. Plus, we're looking at the state of the NBA and WNBA and a report from the first game at the Intuit Dome. We also have stories from the NFL, college football, MLS, and Unrivaled. It's Friday, October 25th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, my colleague Eric Fisher explains just how huge this Yankees-Dodgers World Series is for MLB. Our multimedia reporter Daryl Barnes reports from L.A. on his experience at the home openers of the Lakers and Clippers with some creepily futuristic details about the Intuit Dome. Later, Jason Kelly of Bloomberg discusses the rise of the WNBA and the incredible position that the NBA has put itself in to expand its fan base and the league itself. Plus, Unrivaled reveals its team names and logos, the Giants endorse the status quo, and MLS could make a massive change to its schedule. First, here are your top headlines. We begin by celebrating a group of tennis legends. Maria Sharapova was elected to the Tennis Hall of Fame on Thursday, along with the greatest men's doubles duo in history, Mike and Bob Bryan. Sharapova is the second highest earning female tennis player ever, making over 325 million during her playing career, with about 300 million of that money coming off the court. She retired in 2020 as one of 10 women ever to win a career Grand Slam. Speaking of making history, on Tuesday, LeBron and Bronny James became the first father-son duo to play together in NBA history, but not before they were named in a lawsuit together. The James duo was sued over a 2022 car accident in which they allegedly crashed into another car, leaving plaintiffs, quote, with severe injuries that will require further medical attention, in addition to severely damaging the car. The plaintiffs are seeking compensation, but the exact amount is unknown at this time. A dark cloud on an otherwise incredible week for LeBron and the Lakers. Over to one of LeBron's former teams, the Miami Heat have officially dedicated their court to former coach and current team president Pat Riley, who has been with the organization since 1995. Riley's name and signature will be a permanent staple at two spots on the Heat's hardwood. As a part of the ceremony, the Heat aired the clip of owner Mickey Arison sharing the news with his stunned Riley. Enjoy it. It's going to be there forever, he says. The same cannot be said for TNT, at least not with the NBA. However, the network's last dance season started out hot with an average of 3 million viewers in its opening night doubleheader coverage. Despite the 30-point blowout for most of the game, the first matchup between the Knicks and Celtics was the most watched early window game in the last seven years. Although its contract was not renewed, TNT is determined to finish this year strong. According to Charles Barkley, the beloved Inside the NBA show will be hitting the road once a month to celebrate the fans as the crew says goodbye. The World Series starts tonight in Los Angeles, featuring two teams with arguably the most star power in baseball. Between Shohei Otani, Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, Mookie Betts, and everyone else the Dodgers and Yankees can roll out, this should be a great series, and of course, all those stars aren't cheap. You could fit nearly all of the A's, Pirates, Rays, and Reds payrolls inside the Dodgers, which is $325 million. Add in the Orioles, Tigers, and Guardians payrolls, and you have just over the Yankees, $302 million. For more on this Clash of the Titans, I spoke to my colleague Eric Fisher, and that conversation is next. Now by front office sports newsletter writer Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Oh, great to have you on. As always, um, Dodgers Yankees World Series is upon us, uh, and it is not cheap if you don't have a press pass to get into those games. Uh, yeah, so we've been seeing some of the ticket resale prices, and they are as high as anything that we've seen for the World Series since that famous Cubs run to break the 108 year curse in 2016. Uh, Overall average price in excess of three thousand dollars. It's even higher in New York. Those games three, four, and five, particularly game three in the Bronx, uh, is going to set you back uh, perhaps more than four thousand on average. Uh, and just even to get in and some standing room tickets, you're looking at north of twelve hundred dollars for the cheapest, cheapest stuff. And obviously, if you want something really good, you're moving into five figures at that point. Uh, but you know, this is, uh, you know, the dream has come true. Everybody wanted this series. We've got Ochani, we've got Judge, we've got Mookie Betts, we've got Juan Soto. Uh, all the stars are here. And, uh, you know, as you said, it's not cheap. Yeah, I mean, this is, as we've said, the absolute dream matchup. It's the two biggest markets. It's, uh, yeah, the, the biggest stars. And Ohtani, of course, is, you know, the famous or second most famous baseball player in the U.S., but we're starting to understand his global impact, obviously, specifically in Japan, through his playoff run. Yeah, so we've seen numbers come out so far for uh, in Japan, his home country, for certain games in the 
LDS and the LCS. And in certain instances, in both of those playoff rounds, we've seen viewership in Japan north of 12 million per game and numbers that far exceed what's occurred in the U.S., even though the U.S. has a population roughly three times as large. And this entire playoffs, it's important to note, is done each round, even going back to the wild card round, is done very well domestically. We're do, seeing some of the best ratings here in the U.S. than we've seen since 2017 uh, in a very different changed media landscape. But as good as things are here, that viewership is substantially better in Japan. Yeah, and you have to assume that trend is going to continue um, you know, in the World Series. Particularly for game one, because that's going to be Saturday morning in, in Tokyo. That's going to be a weekend morning, so there's going to be a lot of availability for tune in at that point. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, on the New York side of things, you know, it's the, the, the Yankees are still the Yankees. You know, in many ways, they're still the biggest global brand that MLB has. What does it mean to have them in there? Oh, huge, huge. And it's been a 15 year drought. This is tied for the longest in franchise history, uh, going back to the 81 to 96 stretch. Uh, and in this time, even though we didn't have Big George this time for this sort of last 15 year uh, stretch, they've been consistently a top spender and we added it up. It's pushing 3.5 billion in total payroll that they spent between those two pennants uh, and, you know, consistently number one, number two, maybe number three in certain years in payroll. And they kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. It wasn't happening. And now it's finally happened. And so you, uh, again, you certainly uh, sort of, uh, let loose some pent up demand on the ticket market. But I just think anybody sort of connected to the game, a broadcaster, a sponsor, what have you, having this big brand back in there on this biggest stage, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I mentioned some people have press passes to these games. You're heading to LA for game one. Um, wh what are you going to be looking for as you know, you, as you report from there? So particularly on site, uh, really going to be interested to see what the vibe is in turn and what the sort of makeup of that Dodgers fan base is and getting back to the point about uh, Otani and his draw, particularly uh, within Asian communities, uh, the Dodgers already had a very uh, – ethnically diverse fan base, uh, you know, obviously the largest attendance in the league and the largest stadium in the league. Uh, but uh, we've seen some other world baseball classic games involving Asian countries where there's a very different vibe there compared to what we may be used to ordinarily. And so that sort of just make up and the vibe and the energy of the crowd is something I'm really going to be looking out for. Because again, we're sort of in this still, even though Otani didn't pitch this year, we're st he's still doing things that we haven't seen before. And certainly the 50, 50 season, you know, we're kind of in so many, we keep saying it as a broken record. We're in an uncharted territory and it's happening yet again here. So that's something I'm really going to be looking out for. Yeah. And on top of all that should be some pretty good baseball. I mean, these, these obviously are two really good teams with mega stars and uh, this is going to be a hard fought series. Yeah, and then the viewership is the other piece of this that I'm really going to be looking out for. We'll see those numbers obviously come out after each game. Uh, but last year with the Rangers and the Diamondbacks set an all-time low for the World Series, even worse than the pandemic year. This is obviously going to be a big rebound. So the question is, how big can it go? Can it get back up to those kind of Cubs Cleveland numbers that we saw in 2016? So again, I is a reference to very different media landscape now, but there's nothing like Yankees Dodgers. So that bounce back is going to be something really meaningful to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Eric Fisher, enjoy the game. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. 
Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. The Unrival League revealed its team names and logos. When you're starting a new league, there are so many directions you can go. The most boring is just to name your teams after their city with no extra nickname. But Unrivaled teams don't have host cities. They will all play in one facility in Florida. Then you have to decide if you want to play it fairly safe and use names that sound like sports team names that we're used to, or do you go off the board and get a little weird? That's high risk, high reward, because you could end up with a great name like the Golden State Valkyries or a less great name like Boss Nation FC. Unrivaled went weird, and I think they nailed almost every one of them. Here are the six names in increasing order of how much I like them. We'll start with the laces. What laces are we talking about here? The logo makes it clear it's shoelaces. The logo actually halfway saves this one for me. The laces wrap around a basketball in a script L. Still, this team is named after shoelaces, which is ultimately a little uninspiring. Next is the mist. Again, kind of an insubstantial thing to associate a team with, but there are some great possibilities here to work with actual mist, like the team taking the court by emerging from a cloud of mist. Just after them is Rose Basketball Club. That's the first team I can think of that's named after a flower. I think it's classy, good logo too. In third place, I have Phantom BC. They have a fun ghosty logo. I don't get the trend away from plural nouns that we're seeing across sports and in four of these six names, but whatever, they're the single phantom, not the phantoms. The last two are amazing. First, we have the vinyl. So good. The logo is a record with a basketball in the middle. I'm hoping it's not too much to ask that all the music during their games is played on actual vinyl records. It's a random name, but all these are random, and I love that one. Almost as much as the lunar owls. Not just the owls. These owls apparently have a special connection to the moon, so they are the lunar owls. No notes. That's the best name I have heard in a long time. Over to football. Deion Sanders does not like late games, but he does like being on national TV. He'll get the good with the bad this Saturday when Colorado hosts Cincinnati at 10.15 Eastern, 8.15 local time. At a press conference, the Buffalo's head coach explained that night games present a trade-off. We don't like it, but we do love it. We're not going to turn our nose up at being on national television. Yeah, we could argue with the time, but we're still appreciative and thankful. He explained that the team will be altering its routine so that they are physically in a good place for the night game. Given the vastness of the college sports landscape, no team is going to turn down the national spotlight just because it messes with their physical routines, so the power dynamics lean heavily towards the networks getting a yes every time. The Carolina Panthers are set to bring back Bryce Young under center after quarterback Andy Dalton sprained his thumb in a car accident this week. Fans haven't exactly been supportive of Young, and the ticket prices show it. A Sunday afternoon game against division rival Saints would typically draw a big crowd. Seats might even be hard to come by. The next weekend's game against the Saints has tickets selling for as low as $21 before fees. Tickets against division rival Tampa Bay on December 1st are going for as low as $17. The Panthers' last home game of the season against the Arizona Cardinals currently has tickets going for as low as $13. At least they haven't hit last year's low when tickets for a game against the Falcons on a cold and rainy day were selling for $2. Even in the NFL, sometimes the nachos cost more than the seats. When excitement does come to Carolina, it's brought by the opposing team. Tickets at Bank of America Stadium are spiking to 159 when the Chiefs come to town and 125 when the Cowboys visit on December 15th. Many expect the team to sell at the trade deadline to stockpile some draft picks, and it's not beyond the realm of possibility for the Panthers to trade Young, who is the future of the franchise not so long ago. Either way, I wouldn't expect the team to be good anytime soon, but hey, on the bright side, at least fans can catch a cheap game in the meantime. To an only slightly better team, the New York Giants are having a bad year, but owner John Mara said he's sticking with GM Joe Schoen and head coach Brian Dayball. Quote, obviously, we're all very disappointed with where we are right now, he said, but I'm going to say one thing. We are not making any changes this season, and I do not anticipate making any changes in the offseason either. Mara was speaking at a screening of a film about his late father, Wellington Mara, and the owner invoked him in explaining his patient approach, saying... He preached that all the time, and I've probably been guilty of not being patient enough in recent years, and that's one of the reasons I'm committed to Joe and Brian Dayball in giving them a chance to turn this around. And, you know, patience and believing in a long-term process is underrated in sports and the world at large. Mara could have been a little more specific as to why he thinks those two guys are the right ones to lead the team, but that's not the sort of thing that owners tend to explain in public. Ironically, the test of whether his patience pays off may be if team leadership is willing to be impatient with certain players, namely their quarterback, Daniel Jones. After his sons eked out an overtime win over the LA Clippers, Kevin Durant admitted that the wall, the solid block of Clippers fans on one side of the arena, threw him off, particularly when he missed two free throws in the fourth quarter. I was just staring at it the whole time, Durant said. You're not used to that. 
I spoke to someone who was sitting in the wall, my colleague Daryl Barnes, on what that was like and the futuristic experience of going to the Intuit Dome. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports multimedia reporter Daryl Barnes. Welcome, Daryl. Hey, Owen. How's it going? Great. Great to have you on uh, from Los Angeles. So you went yeah. to see both L.A. basketball teams play their home opener, including the arena opener for the Clippers. How would you contrast the two different crowds? Well, it was like the Lakers were definitely the legacy team. All the stars were out there, um, whether it was celebrities, former athletes, they were all there at the Lakers game. But then when you went to the Clippers game at the Intuit Dome, it was almost more of people who were there to see something new, whether it was people flying out of town to come see the new stadium, kind of like me and Colin were, or whether it was, you know, more casual fans that were like, okay, this new stadium looks pretty cool. I'm here to see what it's all about. Yeah. And like, certainly they've got the novelty factor going for them. Um, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll get to more about the Intuit Dome in a moment, but let's go in chronological order. So you're there at the Lakers game and obviously the big moment was, LeBron and Bronny taking the floor together. What was that like to see that live? Yeah, it was kind of funny because it, I felt like the stadium itself had two different reactions to it. Down in the lower bowl, it was like immediate. Everyone had their eyes on the end of the bench, you know, towards the end of that second quarter. And as soon as they saw LeBron and Bronny stand up at the same time, they knew what was going on. Standing ovation, everyone standing up, everyone has their cell phones out. But then if you're in the upper bowl, you would notice that, you know, the 300s and above, you notice that people couldn't really see what was going on. So they were a little slower to react to it. So up there, it felt really like almost anticlimactic in a way. But then if you were down there, everyone that was down in that lower bowl said it was such a cool moment. Everyone was standing up. Everyone was like, this is history right here. Of course, the Lakers are such a historic franchise, second to the Celtics in NBA championships. Their arena, I mean, it's Crypto.com Arena, which is not a legacy sounding name. Does it feel <laughs> like a new arena or an old arena or just something in the middle? Yeah, it felt like something in the middle, especially because they actually renovated their scoreboard um, this year, their Jumbotron, right? So that was really big. It was beautiful. You know, it looked really nice. And everyone that you talked to kind of mentioned that like, oh, yeah, this is kind of new. This is this is nice. So it didn't feel, you know, old, like I'm from Chicago. So then the United Center, it, like it has a, you know, older feel to it. So yes, that didn't, it didn't like feel super old, didn't feel super new, but it felt like something that everyone loved, you know, so it was nice somewhere in the middle. Yeah, cool. And let's get to the super new one into a dome had its first game. So you sat with our reporter, Colin Sallow, you sat on the wall. They say you have to be a Clippers fan. Is it there? How much were they enforcing that part of it? Um, so to get a ticket itself, you basically have to take this test online to prove your Clippers fandom. They call it the getting your Chuck Mark, the Chuck the Condor, the Clippers mascot. One of the questions is when is Chuck the Condor's birthday? It's supposed to be hard to get these tickets. You resale is only they're sold as season tickets and then resale only available on the Clippers, you know, secondary market, the Clippers approved secondary market. So that so that way they can keep the seats to just Chuck Mark approved um, fans in the arena. So, yes, it fe definitely felt like you look around. Wow, it's a lot of Clippers fans. You know, if you looked at on social media, people were like. <laughs> the wall's not going to mean anything because do the Clippers even have that many, you know, diehard fans? And you saw them come out to this game and it was surprising to see. And then when you saw fans that weren't in Clippers gear, they actually had people in the wall ready to enforce those rules. Um, so Colin wrote about in his story, there was actually a guy a few rows behind us who was in a Suns jersey. And then the security came up and told him, hey, you got to take this off or we got to relocate you to a different seat. And so that's like, I thought that was so fascinating on how that actually worked and that they actually had people. Yeah, no, you can't be wearing sun's gear. Wow. Wow. What did the guy do? Um, the guy took it off uh -huh. okay. and then, you know, complained a little bit underneath his breath, but he had really good seats. So I don't think he really wanted to move around too much. Uh-huh. Yeah. And when you're in the wall, does it feel like you're in this giant block of, of screaming fans? Or does it just kind of feel like you're at a basketball game? 
honestly, I'll put it, I'll break it up into the two sections. It's the wall, right? I feel like when everyone talks about the wall, they're like, hey, it's all 51 rows of just, you know, diehard screaming Clippers fans. But what it really felt like was it was, you know, all 51 rows of, you know, people wearing blue and red, red, white, and blue Clippers colors. But then it was like a very big distinction between, you know, the fans in the rest of the wall and then the supporter section. And so the supporter section is like what we really heard about and thought about when you heard, okay, standing room only. People, you know, waving towels, going crazy during free throws. Like this is, these are the people that are right behind the basketboard when players are shooting free throws, right? And they had rubber chickens actually at the game with like little Clippers jerseys on them, um, which was fun. And they were waving around and squeaking during free throws. But so it, when you were there, it felt like this massive, like college student section, but at an NBA game. And so there was a massive distinction there versus the rest of the wall, I would say. Got it. And moving from the wall just to the whole arena experience, did this feel like a new kind of thing, a new kind of basketball experience? Yeah, definitely. It felt like, actually, I'll start with just the fact that everything, everywhere you go is like facial ID. You never have to pull your your wallet out. You never have to really pull your ticket out. The way you get into the stadium is you scan your face on this app before you go into the arena and then you walk into the arena, there's these little basketballs with a camera, you stare at it and it says, welcome Owen. And then you walk straight through. Then when you're going to get concessions, you stare at that again. And it says, welcome Owen, we have your credit card. So every, anything that you pick up, you just pick up, you know, whatever snacks you want, whether you want a hot dog, churros, whatever you walk, then you walk right out and it charges it to your account that you already loaded up. So there's a bunch of stuff like that. And then they have other things that are a little more experimental. Like they have this like parallel reality thing where it's like a big board that you scan your face, you look at it, and then you look at the screen and it says your name, your seat number, and where it is. And you're the only one that can see that. I don't understand how it works, but when I looked at it, it would say Daryl you know, welcome to the Intuit Dome, Daryl, your seat is, you know, row 15A, whatever. And then when Colin would look at it at the same time, mind you, it would say, welcome, Colin, that your seat is blah, 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 blah. And so that was a really fascinating piece of tech. Man. All right. I guess the future is here and it's going to be <laughs> creepy until it just becomes normal. Yeah. <laughs> Daryl Barnes, thank you for joining us on the show. <laughs> thank you, Owen. Bloomberg's Jason Kelly co-hosts The Deal with Alex Rodriguez. We spoke about the rise of the WNBA, the next moves for the NBA, and the legacy of Fernando Valenzuela. That conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by Jason Kelly, co-host of The Deal on Bloomberg Originals. Welcome, Jason. Hey, man. Great to see you, on. Yeah, always great to have you on. Uh, so let's start with the WNBA. Um, they just had this massive breakthrough season. The players then immediately opted out of their CBA. Um, where do you think this league's going to be, you know, start of next season? Yeah, I mean, it is certain that we will look back at this year as the year for the W. I, th I think that's almost undoubtedly, it, like, from a business perspective specifically. Now, you know, longtime watchers of the league will, you know, take issue with the fact that it's all happening now. It has certainly been building for a bunch of years here in New York. We certainly have seen that uh, happening, especially once the Liberty came under the ownership of Clara Wusai and Joe Sai. I had a chance to catch up with Clara a couple weeks ago for our screen time conference here at, at Bloomberg, actually out in Los Angeles. and. You know, she was talking about all the improvements and investments that they have made. So it's not an accident that this team ends up being the champion. Uh, it was an incredible series. And I think one of the most notable things for people who watch this league is that while there was a massive Caitlin Clark effect, you know, some wild number of the top attended and top watched games featured her and the fever. And yet, that viewership sustained long after Caitlin Clark went out of the playoffs. And so I think having that really fun 
an interesting and maybe a little bit controversial five game series to crown the, the Liberty of the Champions. All the celebrities on the sidelines, all the big brands that you see advertising around the W, it goes certainly into next season in a position of strength. And I think you mentioned the players opting out of the CBA. The players know that, and, and they know that this is a league that is growing fast. The revenues are growing. They've got a new media deal. I would not be surprised if that media deal gets recut you know, sooner than, than the NBA deal um, does, if they're able to, to carve it out uh, in some form or fashion. The players want to get paid, rightly so. Um, you've seen some changes on the margins, charter flights, et cetera, sort of better treatment of the players. I think the one question that looms for me, at least on the business side, is ensuring that all of the ownership across the entire league is on board for this era of investment that really needs to happen. Uh, I think you certainly have some ownership groups, whether it is in New York, Minnesota, elsewhere who are very committed um, to investing in these teams. Um, but everybody really needs to come along in order to ensure that the league remains competitive. Right. And if you're an owner, maybe you're thinking like, well, that was the last 20 years was the investment period. You know, now, now we want to cash in. Uh, but yeah, there's there's still the ceiling so much higher. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's still, you know, what, you know, it's 12 teams in this league. Um, and and so yeah obviously there's there's they're going to be adding there um in terms of that cba so um you know if you look at the nba nfl it's the players get about half the money you know give mm -hmm. or take um with the wnba it's something like 10 percent um i don't think they're going to get to 50 percent or even you know like 47 or anything like that in this new cba but uh where do you think they can aim there yeah, I mean, where they end up, it's a great question. I don't know what they will ultimately settle for. I would be surprised if they don't get to some sort of agreement, right? I I think a lockout or a walkout would be the worst possible outcome. And, and obviously that wouldn't happen for two seasons. And so I think they have next season to remind themselves, like, we're all in this together. We're going to figure this out. The reality is, is that you know, the players need to be paid substantially more, um, assuming that the revenues continue to go up. So, you know, does it get to 30%? Maybe. Does it get a, a little bit higher? Hopefully. I mean, again, I'm showing a little bit of bias toward the players here, but like, you know, I think one of the really interesting economic elements of the W, which you know well, is this idea that, you know, it's only recently that even some of the players can really make a full, honest living on their WNBA salaries. You know, it, it, we we have an upcoming episode of the deal with Candace Parker, who, you know, was really Caitlin Clark before Caitlin Clark was Caitlin Clark. I mean, this is a woman who, and this is unbelievable to remind people of, was the Rookie of the Year and the MVP of the WNBA the same season. I mean, she was a next level player. She's now, I would argue, a next level businesswoman. She's the president of women's basketball at Adidas. You know, she was one of the best players in the history of the league. And yet she had to play overseas. You know, that was where she made all her money. She made multiples, multiples of her, of her W salary by playing in Russia. So they've got to get that figured out because the league really only will be sustainable when the players can not only survive, but really thrive on the earnings that they make, you know, playing their main job. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's switch over to the men's side. Is this the best shape the NBA has ever been in, in its history? Gotta be. I, I mean, it, the, between the business, this media deal, the breadth and the scope of it, new players coming in, you know, you have to ha hand it to the league and, and to Adam Silver for, a pretty masterful negotiation when it comes to integrating, you know, some of the new media players in uh, the in-season tournament, which was a huge success last year. I think people were kind of skeptical about that. Turned out to be great. They're going to run that back again. They're talking about domestic and international expansion. And I think you also can't sleep on some great storylines. You know, you're from New York. 
the New York Knicks being a really good team is really good for the NBA. It just is, you know, no matter if you're a Knicks hater or not out there, like that is good. And, you know, the, there's a, there's a corollary there to what we're seeing in baseball right now with the, the Dodgers and the Yankees. Maybe we'll talk about that in a second, but the Knicks being good, the Celtics being good, the Lakers having, you know, I, I stayed up late last night to watch Ronnie and LeBron take the floor together. That's an incredible storyline. And, and so you, you have these sort of throughout the league. Um, you have a great storyline, you know, in Minnesota with, with Anthony Edwards. And, you know, there's just a lot to love about this league right now. And they're leaning into it. And, you know, I got a chance to talk to Adam Silver uh, last week in Los Angeles. And he is, you know, he's feeling pretty good about where the league stands right now. Yeah, I mean, he has to. Um, I saw he said recently that expansion is, you know, not a foregone conclusion. He sees some risks. And um, do you believe him? Uh, I mean, I believe that he believes that there are some risks. I also believe that they're going to do it. I think the demand is it, it's just there. Um, and I think if there weren't so if there weren't such obvious expansion possibilities, running it back in Seattle, for instance, you've got a very um, robust robust appetite there. You know, you have the Bonderman family and, and specifically Sam Holloway, David Bonderman's daughter. They own the Kraken. They've got the arena, you know, ready to go to to bring the the Sonics back. I think the the Vegas expansion, you know, assuming those are the two markets that that the NBA expands to is a fascinating um, is a fascinating place for basketball. It's the, I, I think you and I may have talked about this before, you know, it's sort of the new sports capital of, of the country. Uh, it is hungry for NBA. You know, do you see, you know, LeBron in his post playing days as an owner there, maybe Candace Parker, the aforementioned Candace Parker and her investment partner, Mark Lazary, former owner of the Bucks, they had their eye on Vegas as well. So that's going to be a, a robust thing. I think the big question is how much are they going to go for? How much does the Celtic sale that's underway influence the, the ultimate price there? You know, Adam Silver does talk rightly about, you know, dilution this is from a pure business perspective. You know, you are splitting up the equity of the league, uh, you know, into two other slices of the pie. But man, that's a hell of a pie and it's a fast growing pie. So I, I, it feels like most of the owners, certainly the, the more ambitious and aggressive owners are on board for expansion. I would be shocked if it didn't happen. In terms of, and, and another thing Silver's talked about is growing the international audience, which mm -hmm. obviously the NBA is very well positioned to do. They have, you know, big audiences or, or you know, it's a lot of players and a lot of interest from France, from Eastern Europe. Uh, China, I think, is kind of the big interesting question here because they've got a long relationship with China, which has not been the best relationship recently. Um, there's, you know, one point, what, four billion people there. Um, so it's a market unlike any other, pretty much. Um, yeah. What do you see the NBA doing in terms of growing its international reach? Uh, it feels like they are going to spend a lot of time uh, and effort on that. And I think there are a couple of things at play, in, including what you mentioned. I mean, one is the audience. One is the fact that they, the, the NBA has been extremely successful in sourcing talent from overseas. And that talent often draws a lot of fans um, and a very committed fan base, whether that's in China going back, you know, years to Yao Ming and, and, and onward. Um, whether that is in Europe with Wemby, with Doncic, with, you know, any, and Joker, uh, obviously. And then in Africa, I mean, in, in Africa, you, in Africa and Europe, you sort of get Giannis both ways. <laughs> um, you know, you have Joel Embiid. So, I mean, it feels like Europe, China, Africa are the really big growth areas. Then again, you know, Mexico as well. Mexico City has been talked about even as a potential um, expansion. So um, there's a huge amount of investment there. I, I think it's a matter of kind of picking their spots. You know, one of the things Adam Silver has talked about, and he talked about on this panel at, at the USC Next Level Sports Conference last week, is 
this idea of how they go about expanding in Europe. Is it acquiring a league? Is it partnering with a league? Is it doing their own thing? Those are some some open questions, but certainly the fact that he's talking about it uh, makes me think that it that's it's high on his list of priorities. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, before we let you go, let's hop over to the World Series. Um, yeah. And also, we had the passing of Fernando Valenzuela, who is a, a Dodgers icon. You know, he played in the '80s, and I feel like um, you know it's it's a long time ago at this point. And uh, so, I think a lot of people don't quite fully understand his impact. But we were talking before the call; he was kind of Shohei before Shohei in a way. Totally, absolutely, yeah. I think it's a great it's a great analog. Um, you know this is a guy and I'm older than you are. And, and I watched Fernando um, in the eighties. I was a Braves fan growing up in Atlanta and man, the, the inexplicably the Braves were in the NL West. And so there was a big rivalry um, with the Dodgers. Go figure. Who, who can explain, uh, who can explain divisions and conferences. But um, so I remember, you know, watching him, I remember watching him in 81 when they won the world series, he was iconic and i think from a business perspective one of the most important things about him is he really just galvanized that mexican american and latin american audience and fan base for the dodgers um you know the outpouring of, of grief and support and love for him uh has been immense in in the wake of his passing you have to think the dodgers will do something pretty meaningful to honor him as as we get into the into the world series here but otani before otani i think is a great um is a great explanation and it's a reminder that especially for these iconic teams if you can be an icon on an iconic team you know the sky's the limit in terms of the the business opportunity for the individual player you know and for the um and for the the team and and the franchise a, a friend of mine here at bloomberg is a big dodgers fan was telling me that last week he had thought you know oh, i really love fernando I, I should get a fernando jersey and he didn't and he said he went to he went to find one today and they're literally like sold out in every size. And so it, it sort of shows you the lasting impact. You know, he hasn't played since the early 90s and it really hasn't played for the Dodgers since the 80s. And yet, you know, a, a huge legacy there. And just a reminder, again, that like Dodgers Yankees, man, we're I don't care who you root for. We're all here for that series. Yeah, absolutely. We'll leave it there. Jason Kelly really enjoyed the chat. Thanks for joining us on the show. Always good to be with you. And thank you. Time for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we fill you in on the biggest stories to come in the business of sports. MLS is considering flipping its current schedule on its head, switching from a spring fall calendar to a fall spring one. MLS Executive Vice President Nelson Rodriguez said that it's still too soon to tell if the league will implement the changes or not, but the hope is that the transition will happen by the fall of 2026 following the World Cup. But why even make the change, you might ask? Altering the schedule would see MLS sync up with the European transfer market, which could be a huge boon for the league. Most of the global transfer business is done during the summer window, which falls squarely in the middle of MLS's current schedule. It's a much harder ask for teams to sell and buy players during the peak of the season for both MLS and European leagues. We would also see the MLS Cup likely take place sometime in May, a much less crowded time for American sports than in October when you have checks notes, the World Series, WNBA Finals, the start of the NBA and NHL seasons, and the peak of the college football and NFL regular seasons. In college sports, Oregon State and Washington State's football teams are set to play each other twice next season for the first time in 80 years. As both schools will still be part of the Pac-2 until the Pac-12's expansion in 2026, the teams made the decision to help each other fill out the regular season schedules. The only other time the two played each other twice in the same season? 1945, when Washington State beat the Beavers both times. That's it for today. Leave us a rating and review wherever you like to tune in. If you're on YouTube, throw us a like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.